Good evening. It is again my privilege to welcome you, to invite you to join with me for a little season of looking into the Word of God together and providing this opportunity that I might offer a word of encouragement, of comfort, of sharing the things of Jesus Christ in whom all comforts and who is our peace, who is our strength, who is our champion, who is he that rules and reigns on high, and unto him have been given the dispensation of all things, and thus we would seek to bring honor and glory unto him, believing that when indeed we do this, that we shall know the greater joy. And so I commend unto you, look unto him, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that likewise, looking to him, that we might discover there the source of all true contentment and peace and joy and love. I want to urge you to continue to pray one for another, and I especially direct these remarks in that sense to my church families from whom we are absent this evening and that we might have this to function in the way of bringing an assurance that this preacher has your welfare, your soul's good, heavy upon my heart. And so I am praying that God would be pleased to bless. So continue, pray one for another, and especially where we know of difficulties, of health, and of stress, and whatever the circumstances might be, and maintain a contact with each other. This I would do, and of course I desire to hear from you, uh, just know that I do pray for you and I do so often. And just now that we might uh, look to the Lord for his blessings, we would invite you to join with me as I pray. Father in heaven, I give thee thanks for another privilege to call upon thy name. Thank you that I am able to say unto you, my Father, our Father, even as Jesus Christ sent word to the disciples, saying that he went unto our Father, his Father and their Father. And so in that Christ is fully identified with us in that relationship, Lord, we see it as being a very weighty thing that we should look to thee not only as sovereign God, as the all-majestic one, as the all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, but also as the all-loving one, even as our Father in heaven. Father, I ask your blessings upon those that would give attention here just now. I pray for uh, my churches, and I ask, O oh Lord, uh, for your blessings upon our nation. Lord, we are troubled, and we are indeed looking at circumstances that, as far as we can see, there's no, there's no hope, but we know that's not true with thee. Thou hast brought revival out of horrible situations before, and, O oh God, we ask just now that you'd manifest yourself to this land and that indeed men might again be brought back to repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I want to go to a passage of Scripture this evening that has been very much a favorite of mine, and a couple of thoughts kind of came together in, in leading me, if you will, to uh, address this particular passage. One of them was in listening not too long ago to a preacher, and as he started out to preach, he said, he had made mention of the fact that I believe that it was C.H. Spurgeon that had made the statement that we need to preach at times on big texts, big texts. And of course, I think that his implication there was that the passage that he was going to preach on was one that was well known. 
And that being said, what I'm going to preach this evening, what I am going to share with you, would be something that is well known. Now, couple that together with the fact that it is often provided strength and consolation and comfort to me in every aspect of my life, not only in my life in the presence of my fellow man and my neighbor, and especially of my brothers and sisters in Christ, but also in my relationship to the Lord, as I would look to be in imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ, desiring always to exalt Him and to acknowledge Him in all that I say and in all that I do. That being said, I'm going to direct your attention to Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to go ahead and take the time, although I won't cover that this evening, I don't think, but I want to at least take the time to read the first 11 verses. So this begins, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, like having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also, as God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And may God bless the reading of his word. Now, my reason for categorizing this as a big text is because of the scope, if you will, of the things that are herein addressed as far as we as believers are concerned and then also that are worthy of mandating in the presence of all. That is, we look in the Bible as written to believers that for the most part we will find that the, the things that are here stated are assuming by the writer that there is a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a relationship with God, and therefore we are instructed on how we are to live in the presence of God. We are addressed in that way. Now, the scriptures become evangelistic as we make that application, if you will, directed to the needs of those who do not have the ability to understand what we're talking about because they're dead in trespasses and sins. And so that being said, uh, it's not to say that what I'm saying here, it's only for believers. So therefore, if you're not saved, just go, go away. No, that's not it at all. I'm saying pay close attention because you need to hear about the relationship that believers have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Apostle Paul here, having addressed, if you will, in the previous chapter, uh, steadfastness in the faith with regard to those things that oppose, now he moves to the manifestation of grace in fellowship among true believers. Uh, that that big text that that preacher was talking about 
that I just made reference to is found in this first chapter of the book of Philippians, wherein Paul made the statement, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And the title of the message that this man preached was the best way to live and die. And so this thought being there, but Paul moves then to something here, and he's going on to a direct application. And one of the appeals that he is making, and perhaps a central appeal at this point, is the unity of believers in the faith, and therefore a sense of desiring the common good of all. And so where there is spiritual unity, there is consistency in the expressions of the teaching and grace of our Lord. And having said that, I'm going to be very careful here because I don't want the assumption made that I believe you've got to dot every I and cross every T the way that I do. I am simply saying, though, there are fundamental gospel truths that must be understood by one coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. And thus it must be understood who God is. And it must be understood who we are, that we are apart from the grace of God without anything to recommend us under the favor of God. We're separate from, heading in opposite direction, uh, depraved, ruined at the very core of our being, and therefore incapable of ever making ourselves satisfactory and acceptable in the presence of God. And so, consequently, we will look to the grace of God in that way. So these things, these things that I'm talking about that are essential, we must know that salvation is of the Lord. We must know that he had to take our punishment upon him. And so we understand those things. And where there is an agreement there on the basic gospel principles, there's fellowship and there is unity. There is identity. And so, therefore, it's it, we need to take care. There are expressions of unity that bind people together in organizations, and I'm talking about even churches. And I've had this happen. Well, uh, what kind of a preacher are you? What denomination is? Well, I'm I'm Baptist, and I sometimes use that term advisedly because. There are an awful lot of people that are called Baptist or that call themselves Baptist that I'm sorry I find some difficulties with. And don't categorize me. I'm just talking about in comparison to what is taught in the Word of God. And so the fact is that some of these that do, uh, that, 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 that there's a lacking, if you will, they may have some basis in truth uh, that is expressed here, such as social standing, doctrine, denominationalism, etc. And I've heard people say that when I say I'm a Baptist, oh, I'm a Baptist too, or no, oh, I'm no Baptist, I'm a this, or I'm a that, or I'm the other. And I still remember a lady that I started to speak to one time, and when I started to talk to her, she said, you're a Baptist. And I said, yes. She said, well, I'm a Methodist, and I don't want to hear anything you've got to say. And I thought, oh, my lady, there's a problem, because if we're not worshiping the same Lord, then one or both of us have got a serious problem. But in any event, what we experience in the way of coming in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when we are face to face with Christ Jesus, our Lord, there will be unity. There won't be any of that looking around saying, you don't have it right, or you're not teaching proper things. No, he's right, and we will be weighed in his presence, and we will be find our true expression in our relationship to him. And so it must be. What we experience in the way of encouragement and consolation in Christ must be expressed in our relationship with each other in the church in whatever realm of fellowship we find ourselves 
Let me say that again because I want to offer that as something of a thesis statement. What we experience in the way of encouragement and consolation in Christ. And I've heard people say, I just, all I need is the Lord. I don't need anybody else. Well, he tells us otherwise. And he tells us in no uncertain terms, we do need each other. He tells us that we will bear witness by how we deal with each other. And we will receive confirmation of his love for us as we see it in the love of others for us. And so these things are important. So whatever we think that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, it must be expressed in our relationship with each other. And so when Paul then begins this book, or this chapter, I'm sorry, of Philippians, and says, if there be, the word here for consolation, if there be any consolation, the word here is admonition or encouragement. It's such encouragement as is received from Christ. So what I was just saying, these are the things that he is dealing with. And we are reminded of this being given to the apostles, and such is Christ in us. That that kind of encouragement that we have of him saying that you love one another even as I have loved you and the consolation that he gave them the assurances that he gave them of his power and his presence was to be understood among them all and so his prayer in John 17 and that prayer it needs to be read over and over again and his prayer there for his people for the disciples for those given him, for all that will believe on him, and that we understand. It's not for everybody. It's not for the whole world. It's for believers. But his prayer looked to a oneness in him. He spoke of the unity that existed between God the Father and God the Son. And we honor God in the trinity of his persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And in looking to him and in being desirous of him in that way, we would likewise desire that oneness. And there is that sense that two things get expressed in, in the course of Scripture and in the course of our experience. One of them is that Christ reveals that unity in the Godhead and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but also reveals the desire that his people would be one with him, with them, that even as we are one, that they would be one with us, one with each other and one with the Father. And thus becomes that desire with the true child of God. He wants oneness with Christ. He wants a, a, a unity with God. He wants to be found in God. And so that encouragement, as it comes about in that way, is to be found in the love of Christ toward us. And so we find loving in incentives, if you will, in the very example, if you will, of the Lord Jesus Christ. If any comfort of love. Are you comforted in Christ this evening? Are you indeed aware of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for you? I'm not going to throw it out and say God loves everybody. I have no right to do that. But I do know this, when indeed we are looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, what we are understanding is by virtue of what he has done for us, what he has done in us, what he has revealed to us of himself, it can be said God is love. Every overture of his kindness and mercy towards us manifests his love. And so that loving incentive that we find for us to love each other, not because of, but in spite of, because this is how he loved us. This is not mere sentimentality, but rather it is of purpose revealed in Christ. He was specific, and so we should be in directing love for each other. And so that manifestation. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment 
in dealing with these first few verses of this passage because I want you to see where it is going. And where it is going is of the utmost importance to us because while he's going to say, you know, we could say that my mother would say to me and my siblings, could you all just get along? Would you all quit fussing and fighting? And of course, we think that ends, but there's a tendency for it to continue on. And it is only among God's people who are looking to the Lamb of God, who are trusting fully in Him, that you will find that consistent unity among and in, within mankind. And so what he does here in saying that, that you ought to esteem others more highly than yourself that you ought to look to the things of others and not to your own things. And we're going to deal with that as we get along in this passage of Scripture. But in order to show us the example, he goes right straight to Christ. He doesn't try to sell us on how good it will be. It's, it's well that we understand that we say to people, boy, I just didn't know how wonderful life could be until I knew the Lord Jesus Christ and, and that how great a life it is to, to know God and to have these comforts and these consolations and to know the love of God and all of this. But the, the, it would be good to tell people that. But let me tell you why, and let me tell you who's, who set the example and who set the pattern for us. Because when he says, look not, uh, in verse 4 of this t passage, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, he immediately jumps to this, let this mind be in you. I'm going to tell you how to think about it, is what Paul is saying. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and then goes on to describe the greatness of Christ, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He is God manifest in the flesh, but he made himself of no reputation. He, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation." So this, the Apostle Paul then cites as the pattern. And this is where we're going to with this passage of Scripture. I won't get there this evening, but the Lord willing, I will continue. Then as we look to this and understand this fellowship of the Spirit then, which Paul is going to, he's looking to the examples of divinity. This fellowship of the Spirit is that which is the, that common identity, that spiritual identity that we have one with another. It's not merely buddy-buddy, but it is those who are loved of God. And when I look upon my brother or my sister in Christ, I'm not just looking at one that there's a nice guy or there is a wonderful lady, uh, there is a sweet person. I, I'm not just looking at that. I'm looking at one that Christ loved enough that he went to the cross and died for them. That then sets the pattern for me and tells me how I should look on that person. But you know what? Where the Spirit of God is, that's exactly how we will feel. We will be looking upon them with such love and with such care that we're more concerned about them than we are about ourselves. That's true Christian fellowship. It is of both divine creation, that is, it's ordained of God, it's created in us to be able to do that, to be able to bring it about. And it is likewise divine in its application, that is, the work of the Spirit of God in us and through us would manifest first and foremost in love to the brethren in unity among God's people. And, and this thought, I've often, uh, in talking with people, and they would refer to denominationalism. Well, why can't we all just get along? And I have been associated with uh, Baptist all during, well, in my whole Christian experience. And that dates back to 1963. But 
in all of this, I have witnessed things and I have seen people fall out over just because their interpretation of a passage of Scripture. I have seen horrible things that resulted in the breaking of fellowship. And that, I'm sorry, that it's just it's inexcusable. If indeed our focus is upon Jesus Christ and upon Him alone, these things can't separate us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul names all of those things in Romans chapter 8. If I can't be separated from the love of Christ, I cannot be and I must not be separated from the love of those whom I know in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the unity that we are to have. If we have experienced mercy toward us and uh, that, that we are so moved, that we're moved in that way, that is, we've known the mercy of God, Romans 12, 1 expresses the idea of acting in view of God's mercy. Now, that passage of Scripture is very important, Romans 12. I'm not going to go there. But I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And when he's saying that, I just simply come back to the thought that it is by the mercies of God that we are enabled to do that. And so Paul comes to something here, and this I want to get to and make sure that I don't run out of time. I don't want to belabor these sessions, but if we have known that kind of experience, it'll show. And Paul says something here then in the second verse, and which he says, in no uncertain terms then, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. I would call this message apostolic joy fulfilled, but I would expand the thought to this, that it is also indicative of what any preacher of the gospel wants to see, and it is certainly what I want to see. I am not... I'm not here worried about uh, oratory. I'm not here thinking about trying to be the greatest speaker in the world or trying to attract the greatest crowds oh, through whatever uh, might appear. As far as I'm concerned, I gave up a long time ago knowing that that was not going to happen. But where true joy comes about is when I look at two of my people, and I say that, concerning the ones whom I minister to directly. But when I see them manifesting love one for another, when I hear of their interactions one with another, when I'm talking with one of them, they say, oh, so-and-so called me the other day just to check and see how I was getting along. And that is joy. And so when I'm made to understand, made to realize that love that exists, Paul would say, what is our joy and our crown is of rejoicing? Is it not you in the presence of God at his appearing? Isn't this the thing that we are supposed to do? Having the same love that is witnessed in Christ and each other. Having the same purpose and being of one soul in that regard. So when he says that, having the same love, being of one accord, accord, that means agreement, having that manner to, to be the objective, having that unity in what we know and who we know, and that first and foremost, it's all about worshiping him, honoring him in all that we do. In John thirteen thirty five. Jesus said these words, and you've probably heard me already say it in this series of messages. John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. You want people to know you're a Christian? Show it in your love for the brethren. Show it in your manifest and manifestation of your love for your neighbor. Oh my, these thoughts go on to the ultimate example, and we will look in coming messages 
to the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. You go ahead and look there. Study this passage of Scripture. It is a big text. May the Lord bless you just now. Everyone is my prayer.